Hello everyone, and welcome to our roundtable discussion focusing on community health workers. This is an initiative brought to you by Decano, Atlantic Fellows for Health Equity and the Star Newspapers. My name is Lebo Ramafuku, the Chief Executive at Decano, and I will be leading this conversation. Now, as you all know, we are recording and having discussions under very unfamiliar circumstances where we are all on a round table, but we are all sitting in our respective homes. So if at any point in time, uh, the sound does not come through, we apologize in advance. Please understand that we are working under very unfamiliar circumstances. Just as a way of background, on the 13th of April, 2020, Professor Salim Karim, the chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19, outlined the government's plans to increase the tracing and testing in communities as part of the aggressive strategy to curb the spread of the virus in the country. The strategy is called the COVID Home Visits Program. Professor Karim and the Minister of Health, Dr. Zwilim Kize, have acknowledged the importance of expanding screening and testing where people live, focusing first on high density and high risk areas. Professor Karim announced that an army of 28,000 community health workers will go house to house in vulnerable communities to screen and test people. So today, in collaboration with the STAR and Tecano, we ask the question, who is caring about the carers? Who are these healthcare workers? And what are their experiences as frontline healthcare workers who are responding to a pandemic that is gripping the world. I am joined today by senior fellows at Tigano and community health workers who will help me answer the question. And my first question is to Shanaz, a senior fellow at Tigano, who is a health policy and systems researcher and was named an, an emerging voice for global health in 2018. Shanaz also serves on the steering committee of the People's Health Movement, a global network of grassroots health activists, civil society organizations, and academics committed to advocating for affordable, accessible, and equitable health for all. Her research, policy engagement, and activism has focused on strengthening the implementation of a community health care worker policy and primary health care re-engineering in the context of NHI. So Shanaz, let's start at the beginning before we speak about, you know, um, the, the community health workers responding to COVID-19. Just in your research, what was the thinking behind having community health care workers in the healthcare system? And when was this role uh, conceptualized? Um, firstly, thank you so much, uh, Lebo, for this um, incredible opportunity um, today to, to really raise the issues of community health workers um, as our heroes um, in many communities in our country. So to understand how the role of community health workers were conceptualized, we need to go a little bit back in history. Um, where from the um, 1940s, um, in maybe perhaps even earlier, but the one of the good records from the 1940s was community health workers um, in uh, KwaZulu Natal were organized into primary health care teams um, using very innovative models of community care that were delivered to vulnerable communities. And they have since in many different uh, manifestations through the era of the apartheid times, um, to, a, to key moments in South Africa's history um, played a very critical role at the front line of helping government deliver health services to communities. Many of them have worked um, as community health workers and volunteers, both uh, as, as in, in working class areas and where health facilities have been far away from people and mobile clinics were 
sometimes only available um, in, in, in short spaces of time. So in the, around the early 2000s, South Africa had an extremely high rate of HIV, um, AIDS, uh, and tuberculosis. Um, and many people um, really uh, needed, the government needed to respond in a very innovative way. And community health workers became critical to those responses. Um, a different range of health workers, including home-based carers, TB dot supporters, uh, HIV counselors, um, and other forms of community-based carers emerged during this time. And a lot of those were funded by um, outside funders or through the Department of Social Development to support the Department of Health. And in 2011, community health workers were then formalized into the health system um, in the run-up to the NHI in a program called the Ward-Based Outreach Team Program. So when um, COVID-19 uh, crisis became a reality, um, I reimagined that, that, that given that these community health workers are established, that they are providing services to the communities, to uh, most of the vulnerable communities, it was a natural selection for them to be chosen um, as a critical point to provide that key role of being the link between the community and the health system. Okay, thanks. Um, can you just explain a little bit about how community healthcare workers are recruited? And how many do we have in the country? So um, community health workers, um, given this history, were recruited in various ways. Uh, most of them were recruited through these, um, through the HIV response, um, through the NGOs, and they were operating within um, the communities in which they live. Um, many of them were recruited on the basis of them being agents of change in their community. They showed leadership, they showed initiative, they demonstrated their ability to take, take care, to mobilize, to organize around the crises and critical points of, of, of need within their community. And so often, um, um, and historically, especially around uh, the time where primary health care um, was, was uh, a, a, an important um, philosophical point, um, community health workers were recruited as from the community by the community members themselves. And, 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 and they were chosen as leaders. Um, over the years, this has evolved in South Africa where they've been recruited through the NGO structures. Um, but the key point is that they are from the community and they serve the community. They have contextual knowledge of what that community looks like, who lives there, what the challenges are, and who the important partners, both in, 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 in terms of responding, that they can re refer to and rely on. Yeah. yeah. And but in terms of how many, them? how many we have. So, 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 so for the current um, um, ward-based outreach teams and for the COVID-19 response, they are being recruited by the National Department of Health. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Do we have a sense of how many uh, community health workers are there? There's about between 55,000 and 65,000 uh, community health workers. And, and, and just to say, some of them are actually also recruited by the Department of Social Development. So if you have to add them all up, it's around 65,000. Yeah. Okay. Th thanks a lot, uh, uh, Tinashe. I think that paints a, a, a background. We are yes. also joined by the community health workers from across the country who will share their experiences. Now, let me start with you, Bulelwa, from Mdanzani uh, in East London. So tell us a little bit about when did you become a community health worker and why you became one? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bulelwa uh, Faltain. I'm from Mdanzani. I live, I was born in Mdanzani. I, I, I studied in Mdanzani and then I'm working at NU8 clinic in Tanzania. I started working there as a community, as a caregiver then, because you know, but it's a same program of community health care workers, but we were called names. Some were called um, lay counselors, 
some were called caregivers, some were called a uh, community care health workers, some were called dot supporter. So I was a caregiver. Caregiver was working inside the facility. When we were recruited as EK workers, I saw an advert in January 2007. In the advert, it was said they were looking for youth uh, have passed the standard eight and grade 12 to apply in the Department of Health because there was a, a shortage of nurses in the hospitals and e clinics. Uh, no, they were looking for youth to be exposed to help nurses in non-nursing duties, non-clinical duties. So they will be on the two-year uh, learnership. After that two-year learnership, they will go to the college, okay, the uh, Lilita Nursing College, the nursing college that is used by the Department of Health in the province of Eastern Cape. Uh, we, but we didn't, uh, after two years, it was nowhere to be found. There was no one saying that. I know that there was a leadership that was going on. We continued and then they say we, are, we were going to be, some of us were going to be community health care workers. Some of us were trained to be nurses. But after we have uh, lost some cases, uh, taking to the back, the back to back and council as the Department of Health, some get win and then they were trained to be nurses and then others were absorbed in were absorbed but it was not really absorption they were become each general workers and then some of us left and then we were community health workers i'm still a community health care worker now i'm doing outreach i'm one of in any NUA clinic i'm one of six community health care workers which is a part of the outreach team with one uh, outreach team leader. And then, uh, you know, most the outreach team uh, outreach teams uh, have six CHWs and are, are based on municipality wards. So our OTL is working on two municipal wards. So there are two clinics there. There is NU7 clinic and NU8 clinic. We share the OTL. Thanks a lot. I mean, I think what I find interesting, and we'll talk about a little bit, it's that you have been a community health worker since 2007. And some of the promises that were made were not fulfilled. But I want to yeah. move on just so that we also meet community health workers. We also have Lerato from um, the Northern Cape. Lerato, share a little bit about your experience as well, about when did you become a community health worker? Yeah, I'm Lerato Wesi from Kimberley, the Northern Cape. I became a community health worker. Like uh, the previous speaker said, we were initially known as caregivers, because, but the CHW, community health worker, is just a term that is thrown around, but the work is still the same. There is nothing that is changing and nothing is improving, even though the uh, terms are different. Um, since 2009, even now, today, and um, we have been in informal trainings because we were not getting certificates um, like other, other trainings that we've been to. Um, we are not getting certificates uh, uh, for TV. There are people that got certificates for home-based care. And I never went to a formal training of home-based care. I just got, um, I just heard that people were being hired at Legatus NGO and I went there and I tried my luck and then I was called. But um, I never had like formal introduction to the field. I had to be taught by my colleagues how to bath a bedridden person and what a dot means and things like that. We have been on one or two trainings of uh, TB that was um, hosted by the TB Foundation, but it was just like one, two, three, and it's done. It was never intense like it was supposed to be, but everything else that we I know now is what I've learned on the field, and everything else that I'm still learning is what I'm learning because like you have to be like vigilant and 
just ask questions. When you don't ask, you never know. You will stay exactly where you are. Yeah. So asking questions and everything else, but being aware that safety comes first and not forgetting that that is the main thing because even though you're taking care of other sick people, you must also take care of yourself. Great. Yeah. Th thanks a lot for that input. Um, Tinashe, I want to bring you in here because I think both Bulelwa and Lerato are speaking to issues about training. Bulelwa is speaking about a two-year internship where people were expecting to even be taken um, and, and be trained as, 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 as nurses. And, and, and I assume um, that people like Bulelwa and others were interested in the nursing pro profession. And therefore, as they enter into um, community health work, they are interested to progress. But, uh, and my math is not the best, but from 2007 to 2020, it's almost 13 years that Bulelwa has done, has, has worked uh, on one thing. And I wanna park that a little bit. We'll come back to it. But there is the issue of training. Lerato mentions a very interesting issue that she is who she is because she has had to basically, um, you know, find her own training, learn from colleagues. Again, she is one person who is interested. She is one person who is keen, but it looks like the training is not what she expected. What is your assessment of the training, how uniform is it? What is the standard operating pro uh, procedures? Where is this training of community health workers? Who does it? Whose responsibility is it? Especially because people are also talking about names changing between, you know, there's different names. Oh, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, Levo. Thanks to Tekano and to Star Newspaper. Uh, you know, in South Africa, the problem that we have is that there is no particular policy that governs the program of CHWs. So as a result of that, there's no standard training to be followed when training these CHWs. So each, each province and each uh, or NGO does what they feel is the right and the proper procedures. We had NGOs being, being, um, being, uh, we had NGOs uh, um, who trained on behalf, who trained CHWs on behalf of the of the Department of Health, but then they don't do, they don't follow a particular procedure. They follow different ways that they follow, but there are some materials that in some in some provinces they've got manuals that they have to do each and every Friday morning. They have to do an in-house training with the colleagues, with the facility managers, with the district managers and so forth. But this is never uniform. You go to one facility, it differs from the other. You go to one uh, district, it differs from the other. As well as provincial, it differs from each other because of the lack of the standard policy of, that governs CHWs. I think you raise an important uh, point, uh, 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 Tinashe, and, and I think there's so many points that are coming in, you know, that are not even the questions I wanted to ask. Because it also speaks about monitoring uh, yes. uh, of community health workers. And I want to bring in another uh, senior fellow at Tikano, uh, Renee Sparks, who also is working in the health sector and is very interested in the issue of um, community health workers. Welcome, Renee. Monitoring. Once community health workers are at a facility, and I know that you are in the health sector, who monitors the work that they do and the quality of training and outputs that they bring? Hi, Lebo. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to, to be joining you. Um, so yes, uh, I agree with what Tanashi was saying. It's um, really quite haphazard. I know in the province that I'm in, there is a bit more standardization with um, government using um, resources from KTU. Uh, so there's a curriculum that they use and they're trying out new things, but that's not uh, the norm 
in terms of monitoring, it's, it differs from authority to authority. I know um, coming from the Western Cape, we've got City Health and then we've also got MHS, the Metro Health Services. So they, it's split in terms of who's going to care for those um, CHWs and monitor their work and then, and then speak to that. So I definitely agree that um, with the fact that there's been different uh, strokes for different organizations, you have different NGOs running things on different standards, it would be great if it was one standardized approach uh, to monitoring and to the training, essentially. Thanks a lot. But I think, um, you know, while we identify some of these training challenges, there is no doubt uh, as was uh, 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 discussed with uh, uh, Dr. Mkize and Professor Salim, that community health workers provide an essential service. Nolutando, Nolutando, maybe you can share with us what your typical day looks like as a community health worker. What, what services do you offer? And maybe tell us where you come from. Hi, everyone. Hi. My name is Norutan. I'm from KZN in Etequini. Uh, I've been a CHW since 2012. Ne? Mm -hmm. And um, my everyday work, ne? I just go in the household. Usually on Mondays, we go to the clinic, we collect the defaulters, we collect our everyday work. And then we will go to the community. We also have Pilam Twana sites, whereby we will screen the children who are under five and so on. And then we will also visit people in door to door, checking if they're collecting their medication, supplying them with the home-based kits, educating them, giving them health education every day. So basically that is our work. Okay. And it's a matter of mass that you attend the war room. What is the war room? Explain that to us. Okay, war well, room, it's Operation Sugumasake, where mm -hmm. all the departments meet. And then you, as, us as community health care workers, will come back with the information from the community. And then we will refer them to relevant departments. If like we had somebody who did not have an ID or somebody who needs um, um, to be helped through SASA, and then we will need to report to, to the particular person there in the war room. But then okay, we do have the challenges because the departments are not attending and we end up having a lot of work. Uh, people are not being helped. It's a, a challenge for us. And sometimes you'll find that there are cases that like for water and housing, those are the cases that you need to refer to a counselor. But you'll find the counselor referring, referring people to us for those cases. So it becomes a challenge in most of the times. Okay. So you... you doing all you come in into a home to do one thing you find mm. different problems and you attend to them all yeah and basically I, I can say today i'm going to 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 to, to pay um maybe unolutandom song defaulting the medication then when i get to the household i'll find unolutando is now bedridden unolutando does not have food unolutando does not have an id maybe have three kids who are not even collecting grants, who are supposed to collect grants, then you'll end up being paid. You, as much as they say we, we, we are focusing on health issues, we are not focusing on health issues. We, we, we are more like social. One day you are a social worker, the second day you are a teacher, everything, you do everything. Yeah. So that's great, Norutando. And, and I want to ask you very basic questions because I think I want us to uh, paint a picture for people who are joining us. Okay. What time do you wake up? How do you get to these homes? Do you walk? Do you have a car? What support does Nolutando have to go into these homes? How, you know, the distances you travel on a day? How do you travel, for an example? Okay. Because I was privileged enough to have a family that can take me to, to my workplace, to my point where I'll be working. But I'll, let me talk about my colleagues. I have a colleague who will walk um, maybe from, a, I don't know how, how long I can take, but who will take a long walk to a point where she's supposed to work. Uh, in, in, maybe if we're doing about Pilam Twana, more especially, because the Pilam, Pilam Twanas are situated in different areas. And... At first, they said that the CHW needs to work within their areas. 
but now you'll find that the world is too big and there are two less of the stage that we use. So you end up being scattered. Luckily, in our clinic, we've tried to fight for our rights. So we have OTL. One of the ladies was talking about OTL, which is um, outreach team leader. Our outreach team leader will request the car in the clinic. Then in that case, they can be able to maneuver us around the, the, the area. But it's only in Phoenix. In other areas, they are still struggling. Okay, so they've yeah. got to walk. Yes, and they've got to walk money for transport if you've got to walk there's no money for transports you just walk on your own and even if you you, you it happened we have a colleague with we've, we've, we've had a colleague who've passed away recently because of tb she was helping this other old lady who had tb she was going on on that household every day in the morning to remind her of taking her pills and then she was infected of tb Nothing was done with that lady. She just passed away. It was like a red passed on. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much. Renee, I want to come back to you again. You are in a health facility. Am I correct? Anit? Renee? Um, so, hi, sorry. Uh, so, no, I'm no longer based in a health facility. I'm now in a provincial office, um, but still doing okay. site visits to facilities. Okay. What is the working relationship between nurses who are paid, who've got, I want to believe, benefits, and these um, community health workers like, uh, uh, you know, Ndombe uh, Temba, Nolutando, when you hear these stories around, um, you know, um, the work that the community health workers are doing? Well, um, I, I can do it from a personal perspective, having worked in an ARV clinic and having used um, CHW's uh, services there. Uh, I mean, they are, without a doubt, um, seriously the backbone of what is needed in, in our facilities. Um, and having them work for only a certain amount of hours didn't really see all the, the clients that we needed to um, being serviced. So. It was hard because now you're giving them a list, like the rightfully, as they're saying, they're going to these um, areas and they're walking. We're not taking them there. We're expecting something to come back. We expect the paperwork to be done. We expect the feedback on it. Um, and there was always a disconnect between the two. I mean, you're expecting people to work for next to nothing, um, spend four to four hours and find this long list of people that you've not been able to do in the, all the hours you have with the resources of a vehicle, et cetera. Um, so I know that for any nurse, they are absolutely critical. Um, it is important that we have CHWs. We can't actually do our work without them. Um, and it is definitely a painful process to watch when people are telling you they can't afford to do this or they can't um, manage to, to see clients or eventually in some cases you see people fabricating notes because they were unable to get there and they know that they cannot tell the nurse that they didn't go. So we've also created a different, um, you know, an opportunity where someone would not have done that in the past. They are now doing it because of the pressure we're adding to it and they know there's no way they can reach there. So um, it's a double-edged sword if you ask me. I mean, I think um, we can't do without them, but we also not treating them in the way that they can feel valued and, and actually as essential as they are in the service. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, Lerato, are you able to hear us now? And are you, do you have, a, you know, because I also wanted to hear your experience. Okay, I just wanted to emphasize on the uh, TB situation that our comrade was talking about earlier on. Um, when it comes to TB, when we question that, should we contract TB while we are still working as CHWs, we are being told that um, TB can be contracted from anywhere, everywhere, and at home, we, they wouldn't know where we contracted the TB. But they are omitting the fact that we do work with TB clients. But they, the, and if We've lost you a little bit, Lerato, there. And I think you were making a very good point about contracting illnesses. Um, if I can come in there, Lebo, um, just yeah. to say that um, what she's describing is a, a case where government is not being accountable 
to the very people that they expect to do deliver services to communities. So mm. in this case, um, the response to the community health worker who contacts TB is that, oh, we don't know where you got TB from. You could have wow. picked up TB from your community, from the shopping mall, from someone at home. Um, you can't prove that you picked up TB from the client that you visited. On the, on, on, uh, as you do your work. And that's quite um, a, a, a bold statement for government to make when largely the kind of work um, that CHWs are required to do, as you, as you heard, going door to door, it's, you go out in the rain, you go out in, when it's bad weather, it doesn't, whether th there's, there's um, sandy roads, whether it's um, uh, um, whatever the conditions are, you have to go out and do really, really difficult work. And when you get ill or when you face um, a challenge like, like, a, like a dog in the street or um, men who are um, uh, somewhat abusive towards you, there's, there's no real support network. And in this case, where somebody contracted TB, the response was, we don't know where you get it from. And that's your problem. And what happens is that these community health workers describe experiences of having to go to the very clinic that they are referring to. And when they attend that clinic, they are not treated um, like healthcare workers. They are treated mm. like community members. So they sit in the long queues. They have to wait. And they aren't prioritized by the health system. And that's a real concern. Um, and these yeah. community health workers, um, it's an interesting quote by Arundhati Roy who says, um, there's no such thing as the um, voiceless, but it's, it's more about the preferably unheard. These community health yeah. workers have been speaking, they've been sharing their, their stories, they have been protesting, and uh, it falls on deaf ears. Um, and in some ways, it does speak to how um, the framing of a community health worker is, 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 is valued, and whether we see them as valuable workers or we see them as people who are going to pick up the burden of ill health in our, our communities. Yeah. Thanks a lot for that, uh, Shinaz. And I can see Lerato is nodding. Uh, clearly, uh, she can hear us, and we apologize that we could not hear her. We are doing the best under very difficult circumstances. But, but I think you, you, you are raising a good point. And, and my observation, just being on the call, save for Tinashe, uh, it, it strikes me, and I would like all of you um, uh, to confirm, that the majority of community health care workers are women. What is the gender mix of community health workers? And what does it say to us generally as a society about care work in South Africa? And I want to ask uh, uh, two questions. One, I want to ask, Am I correct that most community health workers are women? And secondly, I want to ask whether or not they are being treated this way, especially because they are women and they are poor women and they are black poor women and they are black poor women in poor communities. So what is the role of gender and, and class in the way in which we treat community health care workers? Uh, in, in the country. I don't know if who, who you know, who would like Tenashe, uh, but I don't want you to be speaking on behalf of women. Uh, I, I just want to hear what, uh, you know, what you think about the fact that community uh, 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 workers are. So I'm going to open it up to whoever. Tenashe, you are also welcome to come in. But I wanted to open it up to whoever uh, wants to respond to the issue of People in poor communities doing the work, black women doing the work, you know, because I think we need to draw the line between how we treat certain people because of who we are or who they are. Shanas, you, you, you wanted to come in there. Yeah, I think, you know. Oh, um, you are also nodding. Uh, so I'm also going to come to you, Bulelwa. Uh, Shanas? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to start and then I'd like the community health workers to really share. But, you know, um, it, it, it does seem like in South Africa, care work ends up being women's work, you know. And we look at 
you know, community health workers, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, allied healthcare workers, women do definitely carry that burden in our country. But I'd like to draw us to an, even an Oxfam report that came out, an inequality report that showed that, you know, um, most of the care work is sitting on the, on, on the, on the, on the burden of, of, of women. And um, I think this is central to the global economic inequality crisis. And what they say is to add insult to injury, it's women who carry the burden of both a failing public health system, education system, social service system, and of rising unemployment. And you could hear that through uh, what the community health worker was saying, that they don't just do health care. They also yeah. pick up cases in, in social development, home affairs, and other uh, settings. And I think it's, it's interesting because if we look at care work in the context of a neoliberal um, kind of context, the, the, it seems like the governments shift the burden of care from the state to women who are already burdened by patriarchy, um, by um, historical uh, racism, and by um, the injustices of either in, in unequal um, conditions of poverty that they live in. So when we look at the carers, it's usually um, mothers who look after these children. And, and the care work looks like the, it's, it's, it's such different types of work, you know. Um, and so we need to look at it from that perspective. And I think when we, when we try to address it, it needs to be a kind of issue that we think about from a very structural level. And a lot of these women rely on social grants for support. And when we think about community health workers, they are not, um, um, they are coming from the very same community in which they serve. And often they carry the same burdens in their own homes. And yet their responsibility for the other community members and other women in their community and other families in their community. And, and if you look at the, the ward-based outreach team, many of them are allocated about 250 families to take care of. So their burden that they carry is quite large. Um, and I'd like to just um, um, think about it in terms of how do we take this issue in, in a COVID time where now the, the, the kinds of work that community health workers will be expected to do is even harder. So the burden that they'll be carrying is even more. And what is government's response? How will government yeah. ensure that they protect them? And how do yeah. we make sure that the women in our society are not shouldered with the burden of the state and the economy that they more seem to be like more interested in? So maybe some Thank community you, health Tana. workers. I think you raise so many issues. Bulelo, you seemed to be nodding and nodding. Is this woman's work? Are you left in your communities to do all the care work in the community? Yes, I would say uh, we are left in our communities to do the work. Uh, I'd like to make some a, a little example that I was facing uh, because we are doing household registration. Remember, okay, we get in, in the uh, in informal settlements. We go to Iskwada camps and then we go and at one. One, and one day we was doing a household registration and then we found that in that uh, household there were two young men were living there with no parents with nothing uh, when we were, and it, it was it, the, 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 when we were there it was very hectic we ended up when i get home i was crying because they are living in a shack with no windows one room uh, with an old bed and and they were so weak sitting next to outside the the room we didn't get inside the room uh, we sit with them outside they were so weak and then when we uh, to my partner I was saying to my partner oh let's go to the clinic and we go to the clinic and ask for help and then we, we were we were we were, we were talking we were taking the last stand out of our wallets to buy them so a loaf of bread so that they can have something to eat and then we do equal e contribution and others the nurses in the facility helped us and then we go, and then we go with e e e e think to have isapa on that particular night and then being a woman every time 
we were doing we are doing e registration we go and pass them and ask even now in the is covid time we go to them and ask did you register for e food parcel no they say no and we didn't and then we were like following all the the people that we were, we heard in the community that they are issuing they are having the names to register them so that they have something to eat so i am I'm, I'm with you when you are saying this this woman is done by this work is done by women and is done by poor women because you know as a woman and to live in the communities and to be a, a black woman you know that in some days you can sleep go to bed without nothing in the stomach you know the feeling of an empty stomach wow that's so remarkable uh norutando i also saw you nodding as bulelwa was sharing that experience i mean it it just it just made me have chills uh, bulelwa um about um you know just bringing to life some of the of the of the realities that shinas started us on do you want to add norutando i just wanted to add the you know I think our communities are, are, are putting hope on us. At first, when I started this work, I, I, I came in and I thought that I would be on this field just for two years as a stepping stone, as I was promised when I was with UTSD, social development. But then it, it, ended, it ended up being a passion. I ended up being passionate about helping people. You know, they've got so much hope in us. Even in two o'clock in the morning at night, they will wake you. Someone is giving birth. Uh, no, Lutando, please call the ambulance. And I always tell them that anyone can call the ambulance and they think there's something different if the ambulance is called by me. I don't know why. But, you know, even now in this time of COVID-19, as I was noting, Ubulelo was sharing that people, you, you need to go and check if those households are attended with the food parcels, you know. And also I've got a problem with these home-based kids for people who are bedridden. People are knocking at my door even during the weekend, even at night. Tando, what's happening with the home-based kids? Now the district is saying um, it's out of stock. Uh, they started this problem of COVID-19 before the financial year end, so it was not ordered. And it's giving troubles to our community. So you end up going on your own pockets or writing your own motivational letters or asking for sponsors just to help your community. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I want to bring in um, uh, uh, Ndombe Temba. My name is Dometa Maduna. Um, I'm living in Western Cape, Kailicha. I'm a community health worker. Uh, as, a community, as a community health care worker, working on daily basis, Friday, I mean Monday to Friday, um, I wake up early in the morning to go to work. When I, when I arrive at my work, I'm... I'm go to the facility. I, I'm reporting to our NGOs before about eight o'clock, and thereafter I go to the facilities to collect the medication, and thereafter I'm going to the communities to the communities to deliver the medication. Those people who can't go to a, to, to the clinics, and the, and 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 the things that we are doing on the community, we are doing e home based care washing the people that on the bed, bedridden, dressing the wounds, weighing the, the children, the IMCI, under five child, and doing the, educa doing the education of the diseases, and, and also promoting the disease control where we provide the education, the support, and then, on this time of the of the COVID nineteen, we also do e screening, and the tracing the defaulters, and then doing all door to door for the for the patient the, the, the that people that are more than sixty years and older that are not allowed to go to the hospitals. So we going them to take those medication and uh, people that are taking the EARVs and also taking the medication to, to, the clinic, to the clinic to bring them to do door to, to door 
And then the challenges that we are getting to the communities is, the, is because of the wrong address that we are getting in the clinic, clinics. So we, we end up working for the long hours, as we know that for, for, for usually we are working for eight, eight working hours a day. But now when this time of the COVID-19, we are working for less than four hours, but we end up we're working more for more than eight hours because we are doing for tracing that addresses that we do not find because the, the, our NGOs, they are mandate us if must taking that medication to bring that the patient that, 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 that does not allow to go to the, to the clinic. And then the challenges that we are facing as a community care workers on this period time of the COVID-19 is the transport because the, the Kailicha is very vast. So we don't have the, the, the money for transport to go to the, our work because we are living in too far to near the, 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 the working places. So it's going to, 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 to cost us and even the, the, the safety of us in, in, in terms of in, 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 in tanks because in the dot is uh, so it, it, it becomes a problem guys because the, 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 the people that are going with the uh, the, the abandon abandon most because abandon they are not going to to, to work mostly because we are few in the road. So now we are we, we central Nasi Ambayo, CCCM seventeen, Abandu by few so there is a lot of tortoise in the street. So it's mm. safety to he end up singing now. So we are struggling to get mm. the transport money. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm happy that no and on September we could finally get you because I think for me you started me off on the on the at, at, you know the, the the topic that I wanted to 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 come to, which is the fact that you are at the cold face of our health response, not only our health response but also our just our social justice and equity response. And we rely on you to go out in communities in in, in homes and You've already spoken about issues of safety, and I want us to speak a little bit more about that. For an example, you, you, uh, uh, you started us very well about talking about being afraid, and you are also getting into people's homes. Anything can happen. So how safe is your work, and what are some of the challenges, of the safety challenges that you face in your work? I know, for an example, in this time of COVID, that there has been yes. a news in some provinces that some health workers do not even have PPE. So let's yes. think about safety, your own personal safety, you talking about the source, but also PPE. And I'm asking all of you uh, on the call to just talk about of safety, not only during COVID, but specifically with COVID around PPE and your experiences around safety. I don't know who wants to start and not and Don Betemba, did you want to, you would already started us. I don't know if you have anything more to add or if I can ask others on the call. Okay, the, the safety that you are not getting our work, so is the, the shortage of e equipment. So while we are doing to our kids, the kids, that we are prov providing in our works are very short because we end up no when you are tracing the the, the, the defaulters we don't have a, 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 a mask and the and the gloves so we end up in sometimes using the the plastic so that we can to help the patient in the communities so even we can't go in the house without wearing the mask because we are going to conducted in the TB infection so in this period mm. time of the COVID-19, we are very, very struggling in terms of the PPE because we don't have the sanitizers, we don't have the masks, we don't have the, we, we don't have the aprons, we don't have the gloves, but they, we, we're supposed to do the screening the patient, to conducting the patient, asking the, the, them the questions and educating them about the, the COVID-19. So it, 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 it becomes a, a, a problem a problem to us because we are the frontliners 
of the of the com yeah. community health as a community yeah. health workers to help mm. the people of of the South Africa. So it, it's a big challenge to us because we end up sometimes we are not going we are not going to to their communities because we don't have enough equipment. Wow! Thank you. Anybody else wants to um, add? Uh, no, Lutando, let me come to you. Okay. With us um, here in Phoenix, I don't know if it's because um, it's a, a community that is diverse or what, but we are so not struggling with the, the PPEs. Um, what, what happened is that when they said that um, we are going to get one mask for a day, especially in this time of COVID, we said we are not going to work. So they ended up giving us per CHW a box, a box of masks, a box of gloves, okay. a bottle of a sanitizer, and a, even an apron, everything. But in mm. other areas, um, other CHWs are not working even now because mm -hmm. they do not have all the PPEs. And we, we said here in Etewini, no one should work without the PPEs. Hence, I'm going to you. Yeah, hence we are going door to door. We, we, we told nursing manager in our clinic that we are not going to work uh, in, in this COVID-19 because we always have these challenges. I think sometimes he, he, the problem with us, we need to have a backbone because sometimes mm -hmm. we end up being pushed around that side and this side. That is why they know we, 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 we can't talk on ourselves. That's why they just push us around anywhere they want. So this time we said we are not working if there are no PEs. So people are not working, but with us in our e e clinic, we are working because they only provide, provided us. Yeah. So activism is key, mm. even you. I mean, it's unfortunate that you've got to do it, but you are saying yeah. you are also having to, to be champions and activists mm. for your yeah. own work. Tinasha, you yeah. wanted to add something? Okay. Uh, thank you so much. I'm sure the story of PP is only coming out now. But mm -hmm. after the 10 years experience that I've been working with community healthcare workers, it's not a new story. Protective wow. gear has been missing in this industry for years. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that COVID has exposed this, that our community healthcare workers work without PPEs. Uh, wow. We have come, we have been, I mean, we have come across some heartbreaking stories where community healthcare workers use plastic bags in, 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 I mean, and homemade clothing. In, mm. for, for them providing them with, 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 with PPEs. So mm. I'm glad that COVID has exposed this. Secondly, and my other point that I wanted to add is that the issue of safety, as mm. you have said in the opening, is that commit where healthcare workers work in the vulnerable communities where they came through crimin criminal ele elements and most heartbreaking thing is that they come through uh, sexual abuse with these mm. in these communities you know rape. Um, I, mean, I think yes. you're talking about rape yes 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 they came through mm. rape and all, all all forms of 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 abuse in our community we also heard where they are being in in pumalanga and free state in particular they have been accused and chased away from community because they are being accused of spreading uh uh covid my last point is that Mm. We, have, we have got community health care workers that we also need to keep in mind, those who are in rural. They go down the valley, they go up yes. the hill in walking and walking in doing this default, uh, default tracing and so forth. They get snake bites, they get dog bites, and then the government is still silent on that. Tinasha, you add a very, very important point. And I mean, in the Western Cape, which is the epicenter of COVID-19, and Kailicha being, you know, densely populated, I think in Cape Town, uh, Kailicha has the second largest number of cases of COVID. To hear Ndombetemba speaking about not having the necessary PPE, it's almost as if we take the most vulnerable who are women and we actually do not care about them and about what is happening to them. And I think it's very interesting if you link with it with the political discourse with inequity, with some people even in the Western Cape talking about 
you know, we've done all that we could with this lockdown, release it so that we can walk, we can surf, we can have parties. You know, when, when community healthcare workers in the epicenter of the epidemic, like in Dombetemba, she is a, a, a person. She's got a family. Her health is important. And here she is trying to give service, but she cannot even have, a, 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 you, you know, protective a, 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 a gear. And as you say, Tinashe, this does not start now. I mean, I, it, it certainly makes my blood boil, but that is not the, 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 the focus now. I, I want to, to, to focus on psychosocial support because my sense is that many community health workers, including the ones that we are having on this call, are driven by passion for their fellow community members. I think a, a one of them on, the, on, the, on, on, on this call uh, mentioned it. And really, many of you take a lot of uh, a, a huge responsibility on your, on your shoulders I cannot imagine how it feels like to walk into a home where there is no food, like with the example that uh, we had. Who cares for you? Which is really the focus of this discussion. Who do you go to when you are sick? We've already heard that you go to the same clinic, you still uh, stand on the line, and nobody takes responsibility that, in fact, it was an occupational hazard. Do you get sick leave? or any occupational health and safety recourse if you get harmed in your work, whether you are bitten by a snake, whether you are raped, you get TB, you are overwhelmed. I'm sure some of you, you know, have comorbidities even during this time of COVID, like many of us do. Who takes care of you? And what labor rights do you have as healthcare workers? Okay, yeah, uh, I want to add up on, I want to go back to uh, before answering the one that you're asking now about who's caring for us. I want to go back to why women are the ones who are in this field. I think it goes uh, back as far as because this program was initially started uh, with elderly people coming from poor communities. And it has been women, women, women ever since. and because they come from poor communities. I think now that it is us young people, they are stuck with that notion that uh, it has to be women and we are also from poor communities and our level of education and intelligence is also taken for granted. Like we don't know nothing. They don't know nothing about us. They don't know um, up until what grade we have been at school. They don't even bother to, 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 to look into it, even though we have sent several CVs to the department. Every time they will be asking for CVs, but they seem to undermine our level of, of intelligence. And um, the other thing about who is caring for us, nobody is caring for us within the department because we only have our families to look after us when we are sick. Like I mentioned earlier, like uh, when you contract TB, it is said that you might have contracted it from wherever, but yeah. it is like or on in the line of duty. And the same with COVID. The questions when what what uh, what I was asking was that. Is it going to be the same with COVID-19? Because I'm expected to go from one house to the next um, with no gloves, with no apron, only with a mask. And different masks are being used for the sisters and the doctors and everybody else. And we get masks that are only two layers. And from what I have uh, learned from TV and everywhere else where I've read is that it has to be three layers. We get a mask every day and we are told that um, we cannot get a box of gloves because uh, gloves are not hygiene. And I say we know the proper way of using gloves because we don't use uh, one pair of gloves from one person to the next. We, ch we change gloves like they do in the clinic when coming in contact with a different patient. So now the other thing is that um, some of the community health workers, it's like they are relaxed in this field. When you fight, they will be raising things like you don't want to work 
and they will be agreeing with the sisters that no we will do one two three and maybe four of us will be like we are not going to do it because it is not uh, um safe for any of us but majority of our our community health workers at the facility will go out and be screening but not having proper P ppe and then we are the ones who are looked at like we don't want to work so now nobody is caring for us even i have gone as far as writing a letter and getting signatures from the community health workers and sending it to um the mec but nothing is being done about that people are still screening even today but i am still not screening i do not want to screen i just take the tablets and i drop them off bear in mind bearing in mind that uh, i have to uh, practice the social distance and i would take a couple depending on uh the amount of households i have to visit i would take gloves for if it's three uh, packages that i have to deliver in at, at three households, I will maybe 10 gloves so that I can at least go into that house and a mask, uh, the mask that they give us. And we also use our homemade masks that we don't even know if they are also safe or not. We are just using anything that we can come across just to cover up. And if I, it is very hard nowadays to get an apron out of that clinic. So nobody, is looking after us. The only thing they are after is states. The states have to be higher even though the risk is greater. Wow, Lirato, wow. That's all that I can say. I think it's, it's, it's my, it's my go-to word when I don't know what to say, you know? And for somebody whose last name is Ramafoku, meaning father of the words, not to have words to say, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And I think you speak a lot about, uh, I think Nolutando said it, about the activism that is needed. And I, and, 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 and I want to, to bring you in here, uh, Tinashe, because, uh, not Tinashe, but Shinaz, because of the history of protesting that community health workers have, uh, have had to uh, 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 embark on, just for basic rights. I mean, when I hear Lerato say, nobody cares about us. It is our families who've got to care about us. When I hear Ndombetemba and Nolutando say, we go and there are no gloves, it means that in this time of social distancing, there is a category of healthcare worker who goes out, may contract COVID, and nobody is going to care. That is what it means, fundamentally to me. I mean, how do we, how do we deal with this? How do we digest this, Shinaz? I know you've done research on this. Tell us a little bit about the history of protest amongst community health workers. Nolutando mentioned it, Lerato mentioned it, uh, because it looks like, you know, Rene initially mentioned that, you know, they rely on these community health workers, but it seems as if it's created a friction of some sort where, Amongst community health workers, they need to fight. Those are saying, we'll do it. You don't want to do it because you are lazy. And others are saying, I'm not going to do it because I'm putting my health and my life at risk and nobody's going to care. Tell us about that contestation and that protest where community health workers who are poor, and I think in a democracy and in a developmental state, you need to prioritize the poor. A little bit, uh, 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 Shinaz, about the history of protest amongst healthcare workers to really fight for their rights. So, thank you, Lebo. I think this is a really important question because it does speak to the struggles of, uh, you know, precarious workers in South Africa. And and for me, what's important is not looking at the conditions of community health workers in isolation of other precarious workers, but to see them as as workers who are emerging in South Africa who are increasingly precarious, but that carry so much of a burden of the country and the economy. So looking at community health workers who've been protesting since 
um, the beginning of the, uh, since, um, I'll start with, with the moments since the ward-based outreach team, so 2011. And, and what happened here is that community health workers were being um, paid um, very little around 1,200 to 2,000, it was quite irregular. And um, they actually, um, um, in various parts of the country, started um, to gather, to mobilize, and to protest. Many of them struggled to actually organize themselves within um, um, unions, um, but um, th those that managed to organize themselves um, worked with, for example, in the free state, they worked with um, activists from the treatment action campaign and they protested outside and, and they, they spent a night I think outside one of the health facilities I'm not sure exactly where and then they were actually arrested and imprisoned these are women these are women who care for their for their families um, these are women that care for the communities uh, they haven't actually committed a, a crime other than to demand their own human rights you know, um, and, 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 and they were, were, were arrested. Another group of community health workers in, 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 the, uh, in Gauteng, in my province, community health workers that, that I, I know and have worked with, um, have gathered um, in, in what's called the Gauteng Community Health Forum. And they um, decided to um, take um, the um, MEC for Health, who was also um, involved and complicit in the life of many crisis, um, they took her to court. They took her to court and actually the court case ended up uh, being successful um, and they ended up getting uh, a, a little bit of a better pay. And this is um, the amount of 3,500 rand. But if you look at the amount of 3,500 rand that they get paid, it's still lower than what a cleaner in a facility gets paid. So when you start to think about the kinds of work that they do, but the kinds of pay that they get, this is, you know, um, it's, it's quite a pittance and it's quite actually a, um, it, it's, it's devastating to, to, to think about the kinds of, 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 of pay that they get. But when we go back to, 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 the, to the struggle and the, and, the, and the activism that community health workers do, we, we have to also look at their role in uh, um, a very hierarchical bureaucratic healthcare system where they have only just been formalized, where they sometimes have to fight for their rights against nurses who often don't have a good relationship with community health workers because they feel, especially in Gauteng, I can't speak to other provinces that I don't know enough about, where, but if, where, where, where nurses feel quite annoyed or threatened and by, by community health workers. Um, so, so the struggle is, 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 is um, extends from the state um, to the Department of Health, to the local level where they have to come into contestations with, with the facility in which they work, to have access to their community, um, uh, uh, the outreach team leader, the OTL um, that was mentioned earlier, that you know, just for supervision, just for supplies, just for support. And then they also fight at a community level where they have to face these, these um, security threats um, and where they also um, are expected a lot. And, and sometimes, especially around the case of HIV, there was a lot of stigma around community health workers. So if a community health worker knocked at your door, you would possibly chase them away uh, or the experiences they share is that they were chased away because of the stigma. And now in a time of COVID, this also becomes another critical issue because community health workers are gonna once again have to be activists, agents of, of um, to defend um, their role in the face of a community that are scared, that are fearful, and that they have to carry the psychosocial burden of this community. And to me, it feels like we need to, as a country, look at these community health workers and really value them, see them as our heroes, really um, a, a, build their capacity, build their training, support the infrastructure that is meant to um, for them, and really educate the community around who they are, what they do, and really build a robust structure to support them so that they don't have to um, protest, um, where at the same time there's this uh, um, um, they've been named as 
the army of community health workers who that, that are meant to um, support uh, the communities in the time of COVID. And I'm also just on that point, quite against the term of army and the war rooms and these kind of militarized terms because they carry a patriarchal element. To me, these yeah. are, and this is a humanitarian crisis that we're in. Um, we have community health workers. They have come with um, a host of, um, you know, innovative um, care that they've provided to our communities. They've told us about the many types of challenges they face in the community. And it's yeah. time for us Shanaz, to really support I wanna, them. Shanaz, I want to go to Nolu Tando, I think who also just from her own experience wants to add to the um, conversation. And we will, we, will, we will come back towards the end about you know, what needs to be done. Uh, Nolu Tando, remember to unmute yourself. I wanted to add on uh, uh, the power of, of being an activist as, as community health workers. You know, in our clinic, when we started there, we were not screened. You know, they would take all the blood and give you the vaccines and everything. We, we fought for that in our clinic. And then we are given, you, 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 we also fought for our... Um, you know, if you are pregnant, you get your sick leave, you get your vacation leave, you get your all the leaves you get. Just that when you are pregnant, you get um, your three months leave um, with, without pay. But all those things we, we were fighting for. But now the challenge is we need to be the uniform. That's our dream. What happens in KZN should happen in in KZN in KZN should happen in Jobek, as 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 all the CHWs because now they I think they are trying to break us by doing all different things in different um provinces you know and they make us a lower voice but now if we can have the same uniform and I think with this thing of giving us the contract you cannot be on a contract. For, for, for 13 years, one of the guys who was saying she's been around since 2007, yeah. been in the field for 20 years. You cannot be on the contract if you are working for 20 years. I think also with that contract, they are running away from, 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 from giving us what we are supposed to get or even getting us permanent because they will just say, no, you are on contract, you cannot comment on this and that. So that's it. Now, some know what does the contract say to them? That's why I'm saying if we can be a uniform, help mm. one another, make sure you understand your contract. Because, you know, I, I'm worried for some of the CHWs who are still bathing people. It's, it's not there in our contracts. It's just that other HRs are not giving our CHWs their contracts to read them so that they wow. can understand what is expected from them. You know, I make it a point that I sit and read my contract before I sign it. I know I'm not supposed to pass a person. There was a time whereby we were integrated where Umech was training all the CHWs and giving them those green buckles, bags that we are carrying around. Uh, and they were even giving us 100 for transport. I'm not sure if other provinces were having that, but here in, in KZN it was happening. And we were told that the only jobs that you do, you educate in a household, you refer, you do not bath people, you do not cook. Some of the CHWs even cook for people. You know, mm -hmm. that's behind us that we are getting all these diseases in, in these communities because you'll spend four hours in one household washing the washing is and everything. And some of the people are taking advantage of us in the community. They'll say, oh, hi, don't worry about my grandmother. The CHWs will come. It's important for us to know our rights and understand our contracts so that they cannot dilute our minds. Yeah. Norutando, thank you so much. I'm very happy that you came in. You added so much. I think, I think for me, the issue of exploitation, if I listen to your stories, is so key. That in fact, until the voices of community health workers are heard, and they are heard from minister to you know every other level this level of exploitation will take place there's no other way that i've got 
except to say this is exploitation. I, I want to um, uh, ask another question, and, I, and I'm aware that there is a possibility that we could lose a, 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 a people. It's um, about, and I'm going to ask um, that when C, uh, community health workers were introduced in 2011, this was part of an overall plan to have a comprehensive and equitable healthcare system, which would overhaul a fragmented health system. Now, with everything that has been discussed here, my sense is that some things are better uh, on paper than not. Uh, I, you know, I don't even know how to phrase a question that I had prepared before. <laughs> and maybe I'm going to abandon it because uh, as I was about to say it, I realized that I can't even say, will this plan work? Because clearly there's a lot of things that uh, uh, are not working right now. We spoke of fragmentation, even in the training. We spoke of exploitation, even in the way that community health, I, I don't know how you sign a, a contract with no labor rights for 13 years. I just know that if I was to do that, the labor uh, uh, court, you know, CCMA would, 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 would really drag me to the, to the cold, through the cold. I know that I hear that people are not working and, and as Tinasha said, PPEs are highlighted by COVID. I think COVID is, is here to highlight a lot of things. It's like a torch. It's, it's shining the light on everything that was wrong. It's like, I can see you, I can see you. All of our smaller Nyana skeletons and the bigger Nyana skeletons as a country are coming out. And, and I'm grateful that our senior fellows at Tikano um, eh, 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 suggested this topic and are passionate about the role of community health workers. I think I've gained more in facilitating this conversation. So maybe let me not ask, eh, you know, do we have a plan and the plan would be, but let me focus on what is the missed opportunity? What is the missed opportunity here if we really do not harness the collective resource that we have in community health workers? Renee, you said we need them. As a nurse, you need them. Communities need them. They are feeding, they are bathing, even when they shouldn't be. We need them in COVID. Uh, we announced them so boldly, 28,000 army, you know, of people, but we are not taking care of them. What is the missed opportunity, guys? What would happen if we harnessed the community healthcare workers because the passion and the dedication is there? I don't think anybody will do this kind of work under these conditions for 13 years without commitment or dedication, not even for six months, without uh, uh, effort and, and, and dedication. What, what could work? What is it? What opportunity are we missing to make these people, you know, and, 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 and these committed cadres on the ground work? What is the missed opportunity? Shanaz, it looked like you had your hand up, and I want to hear from a few people as well. Um, so I think the first thing I would say is that ultimately um, South Africa is not a wealthy, we're a middle income country. We don't have enough doctors. We don't have enough nurses, but we have a lot of people in the community, community health workers who can really be um, carry, can be trained and, and really provide a really robust service in our community to bridge health access, which is a real problem. And if we do not train them, if we do not support them, the missed opportunity is that we will end up with people in our communities that are getting sicker, that do not have access to the kinds of care that they need. And we will remain a country that prioritizes curative care over comprehensive primary health care. So to just bring a, a statistic, there was a result, um, a, a study that showed that community-based services represent less than 5% of a district health expenditure in South Africa. 
okay, in an, according to an analysis of both Gauteng and KwaZulu Natal districts. This is very low. And the districts is really where our main amount of care needs to be. To, 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 to provide care in hospitals is increasingly expensive. You need to pay for, for, for um, specialist doctors. Um, you need expensive equipment. And we really need a lot of infrastructure to enable this to happen. Now, if you shift care from, from a curative model to the community, to the primary healthcare model, to a team-based approach, where community health workers are the center, they form the bridge between the community and the health system, you can really create an incredible primary healthcare system that is preventative, that is responsive, that meets the needs of community, and that doesn't focus only on health, but focuses on all of the social determinants of health. It can really advocate for the community's needs, whether it's a drug issue, whether there's a high rate of gender violence, violence, whether there is an issue of rats in the community and environmental health. Community health workers are the eyes, the ears, they really can inform the health system. And we are gonna miss that opportunity. And in a time of crisis now, the people that government needs to listen to, to be involved in those rooms where they make those big decisions are really the ones that know what's happening. And we're gonna miss it if we don't involve community health workers. And that's, Thanks, that's I think, what I really like to share. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Shinas. Tinasha, what for opportunity me, are we... For me, I think South, South Africa missed the opportunity or the way we are now, it's a result of the policies that we have implemented since 1994. We have implemented gear, we have implemented our austerity measures, we have seen a lot of trained doctors going into the private sector, neglecting the public sector and so forth. The opportunity that we have now is that we need to invest in our public health system, one, and give a particular attention to community health care workers. One, they need to be monitored, they need to be trained, standardized training, they need recognition, they need support. I leave it there. And just to add, in terms of the employment, it needs to be graded. You know, they okay. need to be paid and graded. They need professional kind of a professionalization where, yeah. where, where they have a career path. They're not just, you know, yeah. for 10 years, a community health worker with no kind of um, way to improve and, in, and develop themselves. And this is not a, a singular issue because we don't live single issue lives. Community health workers have children. They are aunts. They, are, they, they have communities they, that need to support. And we need to think of the equity issues. How do we uplift these women? who carry the burden of our society out of the cycle of poverty to really become the leaders of tomorrow. You know, and you can see the passion that they have, that they show yeah. even in the school. They are the ones that know mostly what's going on in our societies and we've got to listen to them. Yeah, thank you. Renee? Tanashe and uh, Shanaz is spot on. I was literally going to say, for me, it's the standardization of uh, the training and the opportunity for them to be uplifted and empowered within their space. Um, like I said, we can't do without them. Uh, so there's no, at this point in our hierarchy, it's like they're the lowest stepping stone and that is really not even what it is because without them, I cannot do what I'm doing in a TV room. I can't do what I'm doing in an, um, in an ARV clinic. Um, I really do need their support and the input. I wouldn't know what the household of those clients looks like. Those, exactly what Shanaz said, they the eyes and the ears um, of those of us sitting in a facility trying to care for this client. Um, so for me, it's definitely a career pathway. I agree with 100% and standardization of their training so that they are going somewhere and we know what the standard is in Western Cape versus Gauteng versus uh, any other province. It's the same thing. Um, and I think uh, there's also a lot of, of uh, there's opportunity for us to create uh, or to make this position a better one because it's a critical one. And I think we've been speaking for ages about it. It's not like it's a new thing, but it comes back to your earlier statement about who is it that the community healthcare worker, the gender, the race, the, all of those issues. And it is exactly what we package it um, as that's part of the problem. Um, so we do need to change the narrative on that. 
um, because there's nothing, I think what we can do is create a better image around it. I think too much, uh, it looks like poor equals black equals a woman doing the work. Why could it not be a successful black woman earning a good salary, doing what she's doing in the community? Um, like you've all illustrated already, it's not only health issues, it's so much more. It is actually looking at an integrated um, comprehensive health structure or system that they are already trying to create an ecosystem for, um, but that we're not being supportive when it comes to primary health care clinics or any other um, area. I mean, if I think back to, to multidisciplinary team meetings where they had to give feedback, it's like you were just wanting what you wanted. You're not listening to what they actually had to bring. And so, um, also, listening to the to the health, community healthcare workers now, it makes you wonder if you had listened to all those other bits of the experience when they went to the household, how much more rich uh, would that uh, information be that you've put in a folder or engaged with the client about? Um, so what they bring is much more than what we could do in terms of a consultation room. And our missed opportunities is definitely not having listened to that. And um, if we continue on the path, we are losing a really valuable uh, part of the team. Wow. Thank you so much, Renee. I'm going to give just in a final note to all of our community workers to say, what is your one wish? What is the one thing? What is your one wish of what you want to improve in the system? Who wants to start? Uh, Bulelwa, you've got, you are waving your hand. Um, yes, um, well, my wish is that is to see uh, the, uh, the South African health system recognizes community health care workers. Um, wow. I'm glad there is COVID-19 because um, COVID-19 was, um, I think it was a, a blessing, though it is a bad blessing for us. Because we know that uh, the government knows about the community health care workers. Because if you can hear the minister, even the minister of health is talking about community health care workers. So they recognize the work that is done by community health care workers. So what I, I, I want to see in the coming two years, because I will not say 10 years, I would say the coming two years, or the coming one year, to see community health care workers being the part of the health system of South Africa. Wow, thank you, Bulelwa. I agree with you. Uh, for health equity, COVID must teach us a lot. We must go back to the drawing board. If I was president, I would have used COVID as a performance management system to actually see who of my ministers are working, who of my premiers are working, who, which part of the country is working? Uh, because you are right, it, 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 it is certainly casting uh, uh, attention where uh, it should. Okay, no time to go. Go. Then we'll <laughs> okay, <laughs> my one wish is that um, our government could just um, recognize us and, 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 and make justice with the CHWs in, in terms of permanent post and the government might just have to recognize us, recognize our work because they recognize our work at this time. So they should recognize us even in our pockets and we need to be permanent. Yes. Thank you, Thank you very much, Nolutando. Lerato. Yeah, for me, I'd, I would like for the department to stop boxing us in inferior package, packages because there is very uh, strong-headed people that, that we are working with, people who, who are also clear-minded in what they want. And I think the thing of uh, wanting a permanent position goes without saying because we've been in this field for a very long time. And um, I don't think we should remind them they know that is what we want we've been singing the song for a very long time and as for COVID, they must also uh, when changing uh, things or coming up with new things they must also invite and include the community health workers because we are the ones who are initially doing the work in the field so if they come and tell us to do one two three not knowing what is going on outside in the field it's no use because 
we know how we want to work with this. We know what we come across, we know the risks, and they are there sitting at the round table, not knowing what we come across. They must just recognize that we can think we went to school, we are young enough. And the other thing is not to only recognize like they are doing now in the Northern Cape. Every opportunity that comes across, they will, they will send an email saying 18 to 35. Whereas I reached my 40 years of age being in the very same uh, field. I started when I was 30, but now I am 40. And every time when they, when, they, when they come up with an opportunity for people to apply, they will tell us 18 to 35 are eligible to apply. And that makes me very sick. Thank you. Wow, you know, you, you, you make me want to sing a song when you say uh, the words that you say. And maybe I'll sing at the end of this um, a, a, a podcast. Um, I, I don't know how to thank all of you for your generosity, uh, for the time that you have spent with us sharing this um, information. I hope that uh, from our point of view, this is, um, you know, the beginning of a big advocacy journey that I know that our fellows uh, at Ticano are very passionate about, Renee, Tinashe, and Shanaz, um, who really want to put work in, in, in making this, uh, uh, you know, uh, come right. And as you all rightfully said, you know, COVID is here, and while it is a deadly virus, we welcome some of uh, the inequities that it is highlighting. And as people will say, uh, you don't want to waste a crisis. Let's not waste this crisis. Let us use it to learn the kind of lessons that uh, we need to learn. And I recall one of the messages that I read on Twitter and Facebook that I resonate with. The economy is not closed. The work that everybody is, waking up to is the unpaid labor that women do all the time. The only difference is that there is no stock exchange for the work that women do. And on that note, I wanna thank everybody, but I will end up with a song that says, Zizoji Kizinto. You'll finish it at home. <laughs> Tinata, you are gonna join. <laughs> you are on mute. <laughs> oh, do, 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 when you call When you call Thank you so much, everyone. Um, Thank you so much. This was a great conversation. Thank you, Lerato. Thank you, Bulewa. Thank you, Tandokazi. Thank you, um, uh, Bongani, who made this possible. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Shanaz. Everybody who was on the call, I know some people had to get off. Aluta Continua, I, I feel so, my heart is full for having spent this time speaking to you. Thank you for, 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 for inviting us and sharing with us. Uh, from all of us, um, at Tecano, it was a great pleasure and it was a real privilege for me to be in conversation with you. And um, till next time, the struggle continues. Thank you. Thank folks. you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really Thank you. That was so wonderful, Cherry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.